Hello, we're here from the 35th Space Symposium here in Colorado Springs. Hi, I'm Dan Oltrage. I'm the director of the Center of Space Standards and Innovation. I'm here with Dr. Kelso, one of our senior members. We'd like to share with you some information about the recent India ASAT test that occurred on 27 March. So I'd like to start by turning it over to Dr. Kelso to talk about the uh, initial phases of this investigation. On the morning of uh, March 27th, Dan and I actually happened to be attending uh, International Space Debris Meeting when we got the first word of the Prime Minister's announcement of the ASAT test. And so we immediately started looking into what was released via the Indian uh, press and started looking at what we could tell from the data we had available to try to n narrow down what was the actual target, when the event occurred, and that type of information. We actually had a NOTAM, a notice to airmen, that uh, restricted the airspace in the Bay of Bengal. That kind of gave us not only the location for the test, but the uh, approximate time. And we were able to, assuming a target being an Indian satellite rather than something that might cause additional international concern, uh, we're able to narrow that down fairly quickly to the Microsat R satellite and then start doing additional analysis to show what was actually going on with that event. Okay, so uh, the day after the event, there are about 250 objects released by the 18th Space Control Squadron. Uh, we folded those into our analysis once they were available. Um, and then today, I think we have 70 TLEs that have been released, and uh, we've been analyzing those as well. So we've been following this in a measured uh, way and uh, gradually in increasing the resolution of our analysis. This is a uh, depiction of the NOTAM, the, the notice to airmen that Dr. Kelso just mentioned. It shows the area where India has warned the uh, airplanes, uh, pilots, and so forth to stay out of. And uh, so we're, we're basically building our scenario on top of this. I'm flipping now to an animation of our initial scenario we built. You can see the Microsat R satellite coming in from the bottom here. You can see the uh, launch site uh, up in India and the uh, ASAT coming along. And about at Apogee, we have, uh, we've uh, tailored the intercept to happen. This is a discrete simulation. I'm going to pause it here briefly. You can see the ballistic trajectory that the ASAT was on and the fragments that result from this intercept that came from the ASAT. When you have two objects collide in space, I like to think of them as point masses held together by something like styrofoam. So you can imagine two of these objects coming together. Those point masses are basically going to go right through each other and they will break up. There will be fragments everywhere, but they will be basically following the trajectory they were on before the event occurred. So you can see on the left side of our screen here the fragments that come from the ballistic trajectory. You can see already that they're heading back down to the ground. There's a couple high energy fragments up here. But then we can flip to the right. This is where the Microsat R fragments are located. And you can see that there's a, quite a cloud of them um, following very closely to the Microsat R trajectory. And then there are some high energy fragments up to the top here. I want to emphasize this is a simulation based on what we know. It's not the actual objects, but as we'll tell you shortly, we feel that this is very, very representative of what actually occurred. Now, you want to talk to this? Sure. Yeah. So, uh, by April 5th, the 18th Space Control Squadron had released 58 TLEs, which are orbital data for the uh, pieces of debris that were associated with this event. And we were able to take those and put those into an STK scenario to look at whether it confirmed what our initial analysis showed with regard to the actual time of the event. And so if you look at the, the two images here, it, we were able to see both on the left side to be able to show where what, what we call the pinch point occurred, uh, where the two targets came together. And then we can see that same view 
here on the right side that shows where all the orbits came together, confirming that at the time that we had uh, come up with for the event, that it actually confirmed what we were seeing. Right. So again, just to emphasize, this is real data. The previous video was our representative scenario filmed, but based on this, this information, we can see that they're very consistent, which is encouraging for us. There was a video released just uh, today, I believe. Uh, this is from, the, uh, from India DRDO, which is their military defense organization. It actually has a lot of details about the flight. Um, and I'm not gonna go through the whole video at this time, but I'm gonna go to the next screen where I've captured some screen snaps from this uh, video. And you can see on the bottom left here, there is the trajectory of their intercept. Uh, and you can see the Microsat R satellite coming from, from right to left. There's the intercept. You can see another view of that up here. This is entirely consistent with our depiction with the slight, uh, slight change that they seem to have intercepted more on an uptick, an, an upward ascent, than what we had assumed. Uh, but they also, in their video, showed the IR sensor that they use. And the IR sensor, of course, is looking for the heat signature of the satellite. And uh, so you want that against a black space background so that you can get the, the, the best signature off of it. Very interestingly, they also included a video from the actual ASAT at the time of intercept. And this is the last frame of that video that they shared right before the uh, impact. We'd like to also give you just an appreciation for what a hypervelocity impact looks like. The definition of a hypervelocity impact means that the relative velocity of the colliding objects is higher than the speed of sound in the materials that are in the satellite itself. And this is, uh, as, as was shown on the previous slide, this is a 10.45 kilometer per second collision, and this is well above the roughly five to six kilometers a second that defines a hypervelocity collision. So this is definitely a hypervelocity event. So we're gonna show you on the left a satellite that was built by the Air Force intentionally to destroy um, so that they could get better data on fragments that, that come from events like this. And then on the right, we're showing the, uh, our simulation, which is, again, a representative simulation of the Iridium Cosmos event. And you can see all the fragments coming across from that. Now, the previous simulations we've showed you are more showing you a discrete object simulation. It shows you little dots where fragments would be. Um, and, and that's very useful because we can uh, employ conservation of mass, angular momentum, linear momentum, and kinetic energy, and give you something that really looks uh, what, like what the uh, event probably was doing. But there's another thing that's very useful, which is to look at inertial space and assess where objects could go. Um, and so you'll see on the right here, we have a depiction of the Iridium Cosmos event. And you can see in color code, the high probability of a fragment's presence in red, and then out to green, means that a fragment, a very high energy fragment, could go all the way out to 26,000 kilometers, like is shown in, in this picture. But the likelihood of it actually being at a place that far out in space is low. So this gives you kind of the spectrum. What's interesting is when you develop that sort of portrayal, and this is one for GEO as well, you can then fly satellites through that to assess the risk to those satellites. We'll come back to that in a moment. Right now we want to talk to Orbit Lifetime. So I'm showing again the depiction uh, from our simulation of the fragments we expect we're not going to dwell on this video. I just want to point out these high apogee objects out here, if you can see those. There's a lot of objects down low, but there are some higher. This all folds into the uh, resulting orbit lifetime that you would estimate. Now, we also need to note, this is uh, the solar cycle. It's a roughly an 11-year cycle. 
And we, unfortunately right now, are at the bottom of this cycle. Why does that matter? It matters because orbit lifetime depends on where you're at in the cycle. And the fact that we're at the bottom of the cycle means that the orbit lifetime of these fragments is going to be longer than it otherwise would. Accounting for this uh, fact that we're at the bottom of the cycle, this is a, is a depiction of the orbit lifetime we estimate based on the, our simulation. And this is what we call a, a probability density function. This is, this is a, on the z-axis that comes out of the page, this is the uh, frequency of occurrence as a function of orbit lifetime bin down at the bottom here and size of object. So you can see that most of these objects produced by this event are likely in the uh, five, five uh, to 10 centimeter and below size. And those objects tend to all re-enter within a couple days out to maybe one to two months. There's a range here you can see. But it's also important to note there's objects, very high energy, high apogee, that have lifetimes that can go out as far as one to two years. So it's important to realize, yes, most of these things will re-enter within a month to two, but some of these things are going to be, be up there for some time. Uh, now, we actually have data from the uh, Microsat R after the fragmentation. I'd like Dr. Kelso to again uh, mention what we found in terms of lifetime and fragments. So we have uh, data that's out on Celestrack now that you can go in and look at the apogees for the objects that have been created and cataloged and released to the public by 18th Space Control Squadron. And of the 70 objects that have been released so far, the one that has the highest apogee has one that's just over 2,200 uh, kilometers above the Earth. And so if we look at that, that just one piece, and make an estimate of the mass that's associated with that, we find that the likely lifetime for just that one piece of debris is somewhere in the range of one to two years. Right. So that's, that's noteworthy for a couple reasons. One is it shows that not just our simulation, but actually tracked debris is going to have some high lifetimes. But it's also showing a consistency with our simulation, and that's something that we're both looking for as we move forward and get more actual data. Now, as I mentioned, we can use this cloud-based approach to assess which satellites may have been placed at the highest risk after this fragmentation event. So this section, we're going to actually look at that. And uh, using our volumetric approach, which is a, a feature in uh, Systems Toolkit that AGI sells, we have a capability to do volumetric assessment. And using that and the uh, simulation we did, we identified the top 25 satellites that could have been placed at risk, and we list those on the right of the screen here. Now, noteworthy right at the top is Microsat R. And uh, we chuckled when we first saw that, but then we said, oh wait, that's a really good thing. That indicates that we've come full circle, closed loop, we've verified that our simulation is properly um, uh, you know, identifying satellites that are at risk. But another observation from this list is that many of these satellites are CubeSats. Uh, we have uh, satellites from Planet, from Spire. There's some more CubeSats like QB50 and uh, uh, some more in there. There's a uh, European satellite, Aeolus. And then, it's not shown on the top 25, but we also saw that the ISS was ranked number 50, 58 on this list. So all these satellites and more are placed at risk by fragments. Again, most of the fragments will re-enter fairly soon, within the one to two month period, but some of them will be up there longer. Now I do want to emphasize this list, this, this risk, is actually the probability that a fragment will be located at a later time at the center of mass of a satellite. This probability does not account for the size of the object. And ISS, for example, is a huge object. So its real risk is going to be much higher 
than what's shown on this table because we need to fold in that cross-sectional area of ISS. Now, where could the fragments actually go in space? This is the analogous uh, run for, for the India ASAT of what we showed earlier for uh, the Iridium Cosmos event. And we're showing in four steps here. This first one here with the just after collision event, there's the, the cloud created from the Microsat R fragments. And separately, there's a cloud created for the ASAT interceptor. And the color code, again, indicates the likelihood that a fragment will be there. So you can actually see some red shading in here. There's a high likelihood of fragments being in there. And the color, the legend, is showing up at the top here. But as we propagate the orbit around, the fragments will kind of disperse. And you can see uh, the next section here, you can see the yellow down low. There's a higher probability of fragments there. But some fragments can get up quite high. After we go several orbit revolutions around, um, there are, it, it admits more fragments that can actually arrive there. So you can see banding happen. This is something that uh, we and other researchers have been studying in the last years. And after a day on the bottom right, you can see that there's a lot of bands. And uh, you can also notice the, the uh, pinch line for the, uh, for the collision is out here. So we're going to animate this now. It's going to go very quickly, but I hope you uh, can make it out. The, the intercept point is over here, the very red place. And then this is the anti-collision uh, point, and you can see the banding forming there over time. So that concludes our discussion of the India ASAT. It is an ongoing investigation that Dr. Kelso and I are doing. Uh, we look forward to updating you as we go along, and thank you for your time.